All right. Yeah. Uh, so much of, uh, of how we think about nature is, is, is just another vestige uh, of, of the colonial, you know, of, of a colonial attitude that, that, that assumes that natural resources are property, right? And perhaps all of these enlightenment uh, ideas about the m moral status of things in nature or the emptiness of things in nature, the non-moral status of things in nature. Perhaps, perhaps, you know, I don't know. Perhaps that's part of the same, Thomas Birch would say, right, that, that all of this construct, all these, these rights constructs that we've put around nature, around wilderness, for example, they suggest, they seem to suggest a, a more conciliatory, and liberatory attitude toward wildness and wilderness and species, and yet they perhaps are part of the same story of conquest and domination. Um, right, and so now we encounter an ecologist like Aldo Leopold writing that it's time to give up the role of conqueror and become a plain member and citizen of the land community. Well, guess what? That view and that giving up of the role of conqueror and adopting the role of plain member and citizen of the land community is contrary to the historic tendencies of, of, uh, of Western Europe and its colonial, you know, in, in its conquest of the New World, right? Our land around here was always viewed as a resource. And we live with the vestiges of that. Our rivers, did you ever stop to think about that? You know, we don't like, we like to think of ourselves as a free country, a democracy. Well, okay. But what do you make of the, of the domination of our rivers and our natural resources by the military? By the Army Corps of Engineers, the military, is dominating our entire landscape, right? And that changed the, the entire biotic community of a vast region. 159,000 square miles, right, of land has been transformed by what the Army has done to our waterways. And perhaps, you know, I mean, I don't know. And while this, you know, the, the environmentalists were celebrating their victory in Dinosaur, right? They stopped those two dams that the Bureau of Rec Reclamation was gonna build. But while they were doing that, Celilo Falls, plans were being made to inundate this sacred place. And uh, perhaps those two, right? Perhaps the, the movement for wilderness preservation and the movement to render our waterways, you know, in, in, to turn the river into an organic machine <coughs> are part of the same process, is what I'm saying, right? Perhaps classical American, pla classical North American environmentalism is in, ha has historically served a compliant role in the exploitation and extraction of, in the treatment of our continent, right? That's nothing but a colonial resource. So anyway, and historically these things have always been in tension, right? And it's really only in the last 50 years or so that we've had a, a federal government that showed any kind of res you know, restraint with natural resources, right? Well, 70 years, 70, 80 years. But um, anyway, uh, <coughs> these are all things to think about. Um, <coughs> you know, at some point we have we have to figure out how to how to get get away from uh, reducing our our natural environment to. Uh, to a set of resources and start treating our natural environment like a home, right? Which is what it all, it's always going to be, right? Our oikos. So, uh, it's something profoundly inconsistent, perhaps, with the lives that we're encouraged to lead, right? We're encouraged, we have no choice but to lead, lead lives that are inconsistent with what we know about sustained enjoyment, right? Uh, Anyway, 
There is also an animal rights virtue ethic. Uh, the author that I would direct you to is Elizabeth Hursthouse, if you're interested in that perspective. Um, and her argument is that, you know, look, I mean, flourishing is a concern for all living beings, not even just sentient beings, but even plants and trees. And so the, the concern about virtue ethics, that it's, it's too anthropocentric because only humans are concerned about virtue, is perhaps misguided. Um, it's true that each person, as human beings, we have to work on ourselves, right? We have our own lives to work on. And that's one of the hope, hopefully things you, you get out of virtue ethics is the recognition that there is this whole vast territory, this whole vast ecology behind our faces, right? Behind our eyes. There's our there are our characters. And I don't want to throw in the towel on the political project, right? Sometimes it sounds like when I promote virtue ethics or when I promote some of these more spiritual responses to the ecological crises that are surrounding us all the time, perhaps it sounds as though I'm opting out of a, the political project. We do them all at the same time, right? From my perspective, we do the political project to the best of our abilities, participate here and there in some groups that are working toward political change. But even while we're doing that, we have to keep working on the politics of our own selves, right? And, the, and that is what virtue ethics addresses, right? What kind of people ought we to cultivate in ourselves? What kind of beings ought we to cultivate in ourselves? And, and perhaps our thinking itself is fraught with some of the same defects, cultural defects, right, that cause our relationship with natural resources to be dysfunctional. And so that would probably be a very important project to undertake, to identify those defects in our own thinking, right? And that's one, you know, and that's one positive response. Despair is not really any kind of positive response. And, uh, and it's pointless too, right? Because you always have your own project. You always have the project of selfhood, you know, to create and construct. Um, so that's what virtue ethics are trying to get back to, right? And these old traditions have an awful lot to, to contribute, right? The basic idea is that, that, that there are certain characterological dispositions, there are certain uh, ways of relating to your emotions, let's say. That's a real simple way of putting it. Ways of managing your emotions that lead to a flourishing life. And if you, if you don't manage your emotions in a certain way, then your life is going to become disintegrated and unstable and un not, no longer beautiful, right? That's the basic insight. And, and there's something universal about that claim, too, right? And you might think about that. You know, could that really be the case? Could there really be a universal way of arranging one's character, right? That universally leads to happiness and universally leads to sustained, you know, enjoyment. Uh, or is it called culturally relative? In which case the claim to universality, you know, is not a very good claim at all. They're not making that, perhaps. And perhaps you have to be part of some kind of virtue ethics culture, and maybe we don't have that anymore, and so then we're just lost, and then it has nothing to... T I don't know. But that is one criticism, that virtue ethics is, is ultimately culturally relative. Um. All right, so this is real familiar stuff. You know, we have all kinds of institutions modeled after the idea that, you know, there are these virtues that are objectively describable, objectively knowable in human beings, right? There are hum virtuous humans and non-virtuous humans, right? And doing certain things like what Boy Scouts do, right? Going out and cleaning up a natural environment or just going out camping, learning how to make a fire without a, without a match, you know, stuff like that. Certain things you can do will cultivate virtue in yourself and in your friends, right? Um, and so, so certain kinds of character traits and ways of thinking about animals are more virtuous than other ways. Certain kinds of, of ways of thinking about animals are more vicious. Certain ways of relating to the natural world, relating to ecological wholes, are more consistent with the flourishing human life. Certain kinds of character traits tend to be less consistent with the flourishing human life. And those are the ones we call vices. All right. Um, okay, well, uh, I don't know how much time we have left here. Um, so for Aristotle, the goal of human life is eudaimonia. All right, he thinks that's just indisputable. That's one of those, that's one of those claims that nobody can disagree with. Okay, it's just, we're not gonna argue about that anymore, says Aristotle. And most people tend to agree with him, right? The goal of human life is eudaimonia, usually translated as flourishing. To live a flourishing life, one must encourage excellence of character in oneself. 
All right, one must encourage integrity of actions, words, character, feeling. Integrity, right? These different things should all be integrated with each other. There shouldn't be any falseness, right? Any false consciousness or bad faith. Doing the right thing is never enough. Childs, children do the right thing a lot, but you can't say a, children is a child is virtuous, right? Because a child doesn't understand everything that's going into doing the right thing, right? <laughs> the virtuous person does the right thing for the right reasons, with the right feelings, and the right motives. Right? So it's not, it's not just doing the right thing. Self-management, control of one's character and disposition is central to encouraging personal excellence. All right? Um, the best way to recognize and encourage excellence of character is to defer to the judgments and reasoning of persons who have attained practical wisdom. Okay, phronesis. It's both a science and an art. You have to be old enough, you have to have a lot of experience to, to make a claim toward practical wisdom. All right, and then the golden mean is always the desirable middle between two extremes. Aristotle thinks that he can describe virtue geometrically, okay? Uh, in terms of, you know, emotions, right? Characterological dispositions, the geometric description of characterological dispositions, right? The properly arranged, they're just these glistening jewels, you know, of perfect symmetry and perfect balance and harmony, right? The character is, right? Not too much anger. Not too much sadness, you know, but, but not absence either, right? Always in the middle. Courage is a virtue, but if taken to excess, we call that recklessness, right? Like what happened to Custer. He got violent barber, uh, barbered violent. That's a heck of a thing to say. That's what Johnny Cash said in his song. Anyway, the general don't ride well anymore. Anyway, but that's, you know, Custer... Right, he went charging in there, and, and you might say, oh, that's courage, but Aristotle would say, no, that's just recklessness, right? That's too much of, too much of whatever it is, right? Too much of that character trait. You don't want to have too little of it, because then you're a coward, right? But if you have too much of it, you're just reckless. So courage is always at that golden mean between excess and deficit, all right? And you can say that about all the virtues. According to Aristotle offers a list of nine virtues, and he would say that of all, all nine of these. They're, every one of these is at the golden mean on, on a certain set of character traits. All right? Plato gives us four. Uh, Augustine also gives us four. Augustine basically just rips off from Plato. But these are all thinkers that have tr contributed tremendously right, to Western culture. Very, very influential thinkers. And they're all draw, just steeped in virtue ethics. Okay, so the golden mean is a measurement of beauty as well as a measurement of virtue and character and conduct. Aristotle and, and environmental virtue ethicists say that if there weren't common traits between characterological beauty and physical beauty, then we wouldn't be able to identify characterological beauty. But lo and behold, there are. There are these common elements of beauty. Aristotle says there are three common elements of beauty, symmetry, proportion, and harmony, right? So these same elements can be used to measure the beauty or virtuousness of a person's character, and they can also be used to measure the beauty or virtuousness of a forest, a tree, a painting, you name it, right? In fact, the Greeks might even go so far as to say that the basic particle of matter, the basic stuff in the universe is beauty, right? And, and the universe is constantly trying to replicate itself at the macro scale you know, in a matter that duplicates what it does at the micro scale, right? The micro scale is, is, is a beauty particle, and the macro scale is always imperfect. You know, not quite. It can never quite get it, right? Anyway, but we're all striving toward that, according to the Athenians, according to Aristotle. Right? That's our telos, right? To harmonize with beauty. That sounds more like Plato. Anyway, um, All right, and then you have a whole an, uh, uh, iteration and reiteration. And I just throw all these up there because there's a remarkable commonality in a number of different traditions from, from cultures that haven't been in contact with each other. So it just makes you stop and think that maybe there is something to this, idea, to this claim to universality. If all these different cultures are, are identifying these character traits, as the ones that you need to cultivate in order to live a happy life, right? To be successful. And all these different cultures, you know, there's slight differences, but the similarities are remarkable. That's from a Catholic 
the sloth. Sloths are so cute. I always resent that they named an animal after this sin. That's not good. But I guess they sleep 23, 22 hours a day. Anyway, they only eat this one kind of, uh, certain kinds of leaves, and they just eat. And they, all they do is sleep and eat. But they're very, very cute. Baby sloths are just, go on the internet. <laughs> anyway, but you know, and then here we have a Native American tradition. And again, look at how similar. Anyway, I don't need to, you know, and then you got all, all these other more recent cultural contributions from a virtue ethics tradition. The Boy Scouts can easily be, I, I suggested that every outdoor, every outdoor recreation that has any kind of institutional structure behind it could easily be redescribed as a virtue ethics tradition, right? Whether it's backpacking or river rafting or skiing or they all involve disciplines that have much more to teach a person than just physical, you know, than just how to stay on a, uh, on a surfboard or something, right? And that's a hallmark of a virtue ethic tradition. They teach you about how to manage your emotions, how to manage yourself. All right, and look at all these character traits. You know, the last one, they bring in, many of these virtue ethics traditions overt, are overtly religious, right? And the Boy Scouts are still, they have some religious, uh, inheritance in there that they, I guess they don't want to get rid of it. But you have to be all those things which can all be described in secular terms, right? But then you get to the last one, reverent, and, and that, that probably perhaps can only be described in, uh, in religious terms. I don't know. Anyway, and then there's the Girl Scouts. Problems with virtue ethics, there's that cultural relativism, okay? Appeal to virtue will have different implications depending on how virtue is defined. Virtue can only, perhaps, perhaps virtue can only be culturally defined. And the definition is going to vary from culture to culture. And then perhaps even more, you know, I, th this, this bothers me, this feature of, I don't know what the virtue ethics position is on capital punishment. I don't know what the virtue ethics, if there is one, and if there is more than one, if, then I just wonder, you know, if, if you go to some virtue ethics ethicists and they say, yeah, capital punishment is, is a very important feature of any civilized society, and, you got, and then you go to another virtue ethicist that says the opposite, then I'm not sure. Anyway, I guess the take-home message is that virtue ethics is not really equipped to offer us an action norm on some of these very difficult modern moral struggles, perhaps. So... And then environmental virtue ethics is tainted with the same problems of cultural relativism. Is there an objectively valid, non-culturally relative account of what constitutes a virtuous <laughs> relationship with non-human animals in the natural world? Quick pop test. Take that question right there. Ask yourself, how would William Baxter answer that question? You know, right? What would William Baxter say? Yes or no? Remember his put down of Henry David Thoreau and Walden Pond? So what is he going to say? Is there an objectively valid, non-culturally relative account of what constitutes a virtuous relationship? Yes or no? He's going to say no. There just isn't. And, uh, right? And that's a huge key distinction between, so, right? That may be as far as some thinkers are going to be willing to go. And, and if that's as far as they're willing to go, then their commitments are going to be heavily slanted in favor of an anthropocentric treatment of natural resources, right? Like William Baxter. Is it possible to specify objective, unchanging standards of human excellence regarding the natural world, right? Maybe not. And then finally, the artificial world problem. If our argument for, <coughs> like Stegner's argument, let's say Stegner's just empirically wrong. Let's say Stegner, let's say all his, all his stuff about, about how, how uh, wilderness is crucial to the American character. Right? And you have to have access to it even if all you can even if you're an old man and all you can do is drive to the edge of it and look into it, right? You have to have access to it to build your character, right? Well what if that's that's just not true? What if you can get all those experiences, let's say, bizarre some scientific, you know, some science fiction you know, through the by going on the holodeck of the of the Starship Enterprise, for example, and you can cultivate all the environmental virtue you need in an artificial environment. Let's say you, you, you've got a, a, a synthetic forest. The smells, the sights, even the texture of the trees and the moss, everything is perfect, right? It's exactly like a real forest. So hey, 
let's just cultivate those virtues that the environmental virtue ethicist is urging us to cultivate by using a, a synthetic forest instead of a real forest, all right? So there we go. That justifies cutting down all the real forests, right? Because we can replace all those virtues, right? Anyway, it's crazy, isn't it? It's crazy. But the argument is that if they can be cultivated, if virtue can be cultivated entirely in an, in an artificial environment, right, then why would we still have obligations to preserve wildness and, and, and wildlife? Anyway, that, that kind of criticism is probably fairly easily dealt with. There's a whole range of different uh, moral struggles. GMOs, we never talked about GMOs, but there's certainly those of you who are interested in genetically modified organisms and that whole debate, there are ample resources in all the traditions we've looked at, right, obviously. But another thing we didn't get to. So <clears throat> I'm going to leave a stack of these uh, schedules on the table over there, and I'm going to pack my stuff up and hand out these uh, so if you want to write an essay instead of participating in, the, in our model hearing, then make sure you send me an email, okay? And I will send you a couple, three or two or three different options for writing a take-home final exam. All right? Um. Cool. And if you're on, I know, if you're in the environment group, and you have to find your email, um, yeah. and hang out for five minutes after we're done, and we can all just meet, see you all in the group, and go from there.